Okay, so I have the pleasure of giving a brief introduction to our next speaker. Um, for those of us in the field of sports nutrition, he actually needs no introduction. Um, but for the benefit of those who are not, um, and maybe those who haven't read the um, speaker profiles on the website, I'll give a very brief introduction and then, and then hand over to our speaker. Um, so our next speaker has an extensive wealth of knowledge and experience in the field of, of sports nutrition and, and physiology. Um, after completing his PhD, um, he did a postdoc at the August Krogh Institute in Copenhagen um, in the late 80s under the supervision of Eric Richter, um, studying carbohydrate metabolism in skeletal muscle. Um, he's a recognised expert in the field of sports nutrition, in particular the regulation of carbohydrate and fat metabolism during exercise, um, and also on sports nutrition supplements. Um, he has experience working with elite cyclists and triathletes, um, as well as many others, including the Belgian football team, um, who have demonstrated, I think, ex exceptional like, endurance towards the end of the match last night. Um, he has a prolific research profile with over 150 um, research publications, and his expert opinion is often sought by organisations including the International Olympic Committee, FIFA and the IAAF. Um, Importantly, he also works as a scientific consultant with Omega Pharma Quickstep. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Hespel. It's good to get an applause even before I have said any <laughs> word. Uh, I hope you still have a sufficient degree of motivational capacity to go for another 30 minutes. And I will have to take a little bit care because they already cut your coffee pause. If I don't take care, I may even cut your lunch pause, which you will probably not really appreciate. I have been asked to talk about nutrition in Grand Tour Cycling. I think you will understand that it's impossible to just in 20, 25 minutes tell you all the details of nutrition in Grand Tour Cycling. So I just have to have tried to put some accents, and this is supposed to work. No, that's not I always like to start nutritional talks with some history and this is a slide taken from the history of Tour de France. Actually the first Tour de France was in 1903 and this is the Tour de France in 1904 and you see that the situation was quite different from the situation we have today. Uh, the bikes they have no gears, they have even no brakes on the handlebars. And you can see that in the middle of the peloton there is one intelligent guy who was already having a food bag on his bike, which, and you see, he was the only one. And this man, his name was Maurice Garin. Just to explain that the Tour de France in these ages was quite different from the Tour de France we have today. The Tour de France in 1904 only existed of six stages over a total distance of 2,400 kilometers and an average distance of about 405 kilometers per stage. And one of the stages was even 471 kilometers lasting 18 hours from Nantes to Paris. And you can imagine that knowing the actual Tour de France workload, that nutrition was already a very important issue in, in that time. And Maurice Garin, the winner of the 1904 Tour de France, he made a testimonial about the nutrition at that time. And it was already clear at that time that nutrition made a difference because he did not use the red wine as did the other riders. But instead, during the stage, he used about 11 liters of hot chocolate. He was drinking four liters of tea. He was eating five eggs with Madeira. He was drinking coffee with Eau de Vie de Champagne. He was eating 26 
pork chops, <laughs> three drinking three and a half liters of tapioca, one and a half, 1.2 kilograms of rice, and milk and also oysters that are very convenient, of course, to eat on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> there are some other nice testimonials about very special habits in cycling at that time, and this is a testimonial from a Flanders rider, Elio Meulenberg, who won a couple of stages in Tour de France between 1936 and 1939, and you can see that the physiognomy of this rider is quite different from the physiognomy of the Tour de France riders we had today, because even a rider like Tour Hushoft was, would probably be jealous of the bodybuilding composition of this rider. But this man, he said, the soigneurs told us not to drink during the races, because this might be detrimental to performance. And I realized that due to global warming, the temperature during Tour de France may have increased by 0 0.5 degrees since 1936, but I don't think this should be a reason to tell the riders not to drink about, uh, about 50 years ago. Today the Tour de France is totally different, and this is just a picture of the Tour de France of this year, 2014. And you see we have, again, 21 stages, of which nine are flat, and I hope Mark Cavendish is going to win some of them, of course. We have five hilly stages, six mountain stages, and one time trial. And these are the typical, typical profiles of some of the heavier stages. And we all know that the physiological load of this kind of Tour de France on the human body is extremely high. And there is good evidence that many riders, when being in the Grand Tours, they enter into a catabolic state and they have difficult difficulties to main and maintain energy availability. They get in a catabolic state also at the level of the bones because they uh, have a process of going on of bone resorption and they also have a hormonal downregulation. And there have been published quite some data in this regard in the literature, but I just show you data from one very nice study done in the Giro d'Italia 2011, where Giovanni Lombardi did measurements before and during the Tour de France of some important uh, blood parameters. And they sh what they showed was that if they looked at the percentage of undercarboxylated osteocalcin, which is an important parameter to evaluate the process of not osteoporosis, but bone resorption, you see that there is an increase from the day before the start of the Giro during the Giro, if you look at some hormonal profiles, you see that the concentrations of adiponectin are going up progressively and the ones of leptin are going down and it seems you are, they are going all the riders here to a kind of nadir value for circulating leptin concentrations. And similar things are going on, for instance, for cortisol, where they are du during the Giro you see a progressive decrease. <coughs> You don't see a significant decrease in testosterone on average, but you can see that the high values in some riders at the start of the Giro, they do not exist anymore in at the end of the Giro d'Italia. A point that is important to make when discussing nutrition and the difference between stage races and one-day races is that the recovery is, of course, very different. Today's Tour de France has 21 stages and only two rest days. If you look at the typical Flanders races in uh, 2014, this was the sequence. Uh, we had Dwars door Vlaanderen, E3 Prijs, Harelbeek, Gent Wevergem, the Ronde van Vlaanderen, Schelde Prijs, Paris Roubaix, which means that in fact we had six races and 13 rest days. So the ratio from racing to recovery is very different, which means that in fact we can have somewhat a different nutritional <coughs> approach. And probably the, the most important difference in approach between one day races and stage races is that in one day races we do not have to take very much care about the calorie intake as such. But in stage races, the calorie intake is extremely important. If you look at energy expenditure during the most heavy mountain stages, it could easily go up like values to 8,500 kilo, uh, kilocalories, even higher values up to 9,000. And if during the race we do exactly what we should do, 
that is every hour we ingest 90 grams of carbohydrates for six hours, this brings us 2,160 calories. If we take in the almost maximal amount of carbohydrates we could ingest in between the stages, this means between arrival and sleeping and between wake up in the morning and the start of the next stage, that would probably be 12 grams of carbohydrates per kilogram body weight, which delivers 3,360 calories. If we add to that 3 grams protein per kilogram body weight, which is about three times the daily allowance in a normal person, this will add another 840 calories. If in addition we eat 100 gram fat, it brings 900, and in the end we are still there with a caloric deficit of 1,240 calories. So even if we eat massive amounts of foods, you end up with an energetic deficit which is higher than thousand calories. If you compare that with Ronde van Vlaanderen, for instance, you also have an energy expenditure of about 8,500 calories, and you see the profile of Ronde van Vlaanderen with all the very steep, sharp hills, and the difference between a Tour de France stage and the Ronde van Vlaanderen is that, in fact, on a race day, you should, should not be really considered about the calories. If the days before you followed an adequate glycogen supercompensation protocol and in the morning before the race you had an adequate meal with sufficient carbohydrates and some protein, you don't need to concern anymore about the calorie intake during the race and immediately after the race. The only thing you need to do during the race is make sure that you ingest six times 90 grams, 90 grams of carbohydrates per hour, which brings us to the conclusion that if you look at the nutritional schedule for a one-day race, you would be willing to ingest at least 60 grams of carbohydrates each hour of the race. And if your gastrointestinal system allows you to do it, that's a very important condition, you would be willing to add an, ad an additional 10, 30 grams per hour so you, uh, you end up with a maximum intake of 90 grams carbohydrates per hour. And logically, if you take solid foods, energy foods, you would do it more in the early stage of the race, and towards the end of the race, you would work more with gels and fluid sources of energy. I have said here that the maximum intake of carbohydrates is 90 grams, and have lately noticed that some athletes, they go to labs to have their maximum rate of exogenous carbohydrate oxidation measured to learn whether they could not even use higher amounts of carbohydrates. And one of these athletes was a potential Ironman Hawaii winner who went to a test lab to see if he would be able to increase his intake of carbohydrates during the race in Hawaii. And this is part of the report he got, and his exogenous carbohydrate oxidation was measured. And this is three hours of cycling, time 0, 60, 120, and after three hours. And they showed that his rate of exogenous carbohydrate oxidation increased from 1.18 grams per hour in the first hour to 2.23, uh, not grams per hour, but grams per minute, to 2.23 grams per minute in the third hour of exercise. And the conclusion of the report to this top athlete was that he should try to use 120 grams of carbohydrates per hour during the Ironman in Hawaii. I can tell you that after 120 kilometers of racing on the bike, he had to stop vomiting, diarrhea, and the race was over. So this is a typical example where so-called science helped an athlete to lose the Ironman in Hawaii rather than to win the Ironman in Hawaii. And I just told him that he should look at international, no, I didn't tell him to look at international consensus statements, but I told him to do as international consensus statements say, and that is not ingest more than 90 grams carbohydrates per hour, and the year after he won the Ironman in Hawaii, the Ironman 2013. So science apparently does not always help us to improve performance. Sometimes it may even help us not to improve performance. <laughs> and an important thing is that if you measure carbohydrate oxidation in a lab only for three hours at power output puts as low as 250-270 watt at 20 degrees Celsius without additional sodium intake 
and with only 0.5 dehydration at the end, you should never ever extrapolate these data to an eight, nine hour, an eight, nine hour race where in the end you may be dehydrated by three, four percent. And in addition, during the race, you in ingest additional sodium, which gives an additional osmotic load to the intestinal system. If you make now the comparison between in intake of carbohydrates during a race, this is what I would propose for the intake during a stage in a stage race. In a one-day race, we had only the yellow zone. In a stage <coughs> race, we are also concerned just about the calorie intake. Uh, we know from science that ingesting protein and fat during a cycling race is not going to improve your performance. But over a three-week period, you must be sure that you maintain your energy availability and that you ingest a sufficient amount of calories and you need also to use the racing hours to be able to do that. So instead of only ingesting carbohydrates, we would also try to get in some extra proteins and fat, not to stimulate the performance during the race, but to maintain the energy balance over the three-week competition period. Of course, the recovery between stages is a major issue and probably the major difference between riders that are excellent in one-day races and riders that are top in stage races is that some riders are able to recover much faster than others. And these who are not able to recover very fast, they will never be able to be excellent in a stage race because the jobs to do during recovery are huge. When the stage ends, you have about six hours you can work on recovery before you enter the night. And next morning, before the start of the next stage, you have another three, four hours. And in this period, you have to make sure that glycogen resynthesis is okay. You have to maintain protein balance, energy availability, and rehydration. And that's a lot of things to do in not more than about 14, 15, 16 hours. An important point in this regard is that there is an extensive amount of research showing that the initial hours of recovery after exercise are really crucial to recovery. If we return to the previous slide, this means that if during these six hours of early recovery you are not doing exactly what you are supposed to do to stimulate the recovery as, such, as much as possible, you are not going to compen you cannot sorry you cannot compensate for it by eating more there you must do most of the job during these 6 hours and that's why i always say to athletes that the initial hours of recovery after stage that's really prime time for recovery of the muscles and the recovery relates on one side to the resynthesis of glycogen in the muscle and these are some data from all the data from the lab of paul Greenhalgh in Nottingham, where they look at glycogen depletion during exercise and then the repletion of glycogen during the next 24 hours. And if we put the eating times in the Tour de France on this, on this graph, and this is the arrival of the stage, this, are the, this is the first six hours of recovery, and you can see that the rate of glycogen resynthesis is much faster during the initial six hours then later on after the night rest the next morning. So if you do not take advantage of these initial hours of recovery to fill up the carbohydrate store in the muscle, you, are, you will be unable to compensate for it the next morning. And the question then is how much carbohydrates do we have to ingest? And this is a nice, very nice synthesis uh, graph made by Louise <coughs> Berg in 2011 in the Olympic consensus statement which shows that if you want to stimulate muscle glycogen resynthesis rate as much as possible, <coughs> the rate which you will eventually establish depends, of course, on what you eat. And if you would only use carbohydrates, this is the full line, your muscles would require an intake of carbohydrates of somewhere between 1.2 and 1.4 grams carbohydrates per kilogram per hour to obtain a maximum rate of glycogen resynthesis. If, however, we do not only ingest carbohydrates, but we make a mixture of protein and carbohydrates, 
you can see that we reach a higher level of glycogen resynthesis at lower intakes of carbohydrate. And you would only need about 1.0, 1.2 grams of carbohydrate intake to reach a maximum rate of glycogen resynthesis. So that's probably what we need to do. We need to ingest <coughs> carbohydrates in conjunction with protein to avoid that we have to eat excessive amounts of carbohydrates. And at the same point, when we eat protein, we will also stimulate the protein synthesis in the muscle. Maybe immediately show this. If you look at post-exercise protein synthesis, this is fractional synthetic rate, which reflects the rate of protein synthesis in the muscle after an endurance exercise event, the study by Hort and co in 2008. You see that if you eat a low dose of carbohydrates or a high dose of carbohydrates after an endurance exercise event, you maintain a rather low rate of muscle protein synthesis. But if you co-ingest protein with the carbohydrates, you can substantially increase the rate of protein synthesis. And that's what exactly you want to do in between the stages. You are not only willing to resynthesize the glycogen in the muscle, but you want to make sure you also stimulate the protein synthesis, which, which is essential in an integrated recovery process. So immediately after the finish, taking into account the principle of recovery prime time, we would always give a bottle containing 70 grams of carbohydrates with a maltodextrin glucose solution, 15 grams of whey protein hydrolysate, 10 grams of whey pro protein isolate, plus leucine to stimulate the insulin uh, level in the blood and to activate mTOR, but I do not want to go too much in detail, and additional sodium, and I will come later to that, to stimulate the rehydration. So by giving this bolus, of carbohydrates and high quality protein, you immediately trigger the, the, uh, the essential recovery processes at the level of the skeletal, skeletal muscles. What we do next, this is the arrival, we give the recovery bottle. In the end, you, you should make sure that in the six hours of recovery in the evening, you end up by providing about seven, eight grams of carbohydrates per kilogram body weight, and about 1.52 grams of protein to stimulate continuously the protein synthesis in the muscle. And next morning, you should add another 3-4 grams of carbohydrate and also protein. So in total, you have at least 10 and maximum 12 grams of carbohydrates over the full period of 15, 16 hours of recovery. And how should you do it? I think everybody who has been at the Tour de France in the bus and in a hotel knows that is, this is almost a continuous eating process. After they have emptied the recovery drink after the finish, they go to the bus uh, where they will restart eating some other snacks. And you have a process that after the recovery drinks, you must continue to provide them with snacks and drinks containing carbohydrate and protein. At some point, around 8.30 in the evening, they will go to dinner. And even after dinner, you will be willing to give them some extra snacks or drinks, providing some extra carbohydrates and also protein, because it has been shown, for instance, that a late night snack with about 15, 20 grams of high quality protein will also help to maintain your rate of protein synthesis overnight, which in the Tour de France is conceivably important. And then the next morning the game goes on and you restart the morning by a huge breakfast containing protein and carbohydrates. And in the way to the start on the bus or during traveling, you will continue to ingest some extra snacks to fill up the body stores with glycogen and provide some extra protein to the muscle. What we would also typically do and I show this slide because it's extremely important in the Tour de France that we do not always think as scientists, but that we also think in the, how to say, as riders think, they want to have nice food. And during massage, for instance, you could give them another bottle with a recovery shake. But most of these recovery shakes with excellent ingredients, the taste is not really excellent. So if during the massage, you would give another bottle 
with leucine and protein hydrolysate, in the end they may start to hate it. So what we have learned to do is just make very nice smoothies and that's why we have a team chef that changes the ingredients and the taste but always it ends up by an addition of 20-25 grams of waste. So a protein mixture and 70 grams of carbohydrates. And it's important to play with, to creatively play with the nutrients because cyclists, they don't ingest grams of carbohydrates, but they want to have enjoyable foods to help them in their recovery process. Maybe this is a slide I can, sp I can skip because it just shows that you had just have to provide in the hotel during traveling on the airplane in the buses snacks and drinks that help the riders to have easy access to protein carbohydrates and I think everybody involved in Tour de France knows what this means. Let's come to the next point that's the rehydration and most of you are probably familiar with it and the way we would evaluate rehydration in athletes, and in this case in uh, cyclists, is look at the color of the urine. And you should be careful because looking at the color of the urine is not always a good measurement, for instance, because if you take vitamin B, your urine will also have a yellow color. And this is artificial color, let me say. But if you don't take vitamins, you, you know probably that if your urine color looks like a fantastic Belgian triple Westmaler, <laughs> you are seriously dehydrated. And if your urine looks like the dark Westmaler, I think you urgently need to go to the team doctor because you have a major problem. And I hope there are not too many Dutch people here in the audience, but I have never understood why they have invented a Heineken light. <laughs> <laughs> because by definition a Heineken is light at least <laughs> at least if you compare it with the excellent Belgian beer <laughs> but the closer the color of your urine gets to the Heineken light the better is your status of rehydration and this helps you to tell that you have been adequately rehydrating and the body fluid balance is getting where it should eventually be. Of course, the most scientific and most correct way to do it is measured with the refractometer, the urinary osmolality, which gives you objective quantitative information. And typically in stages where riders have been exercising really in the heat and are extremely dehydrated, we would never ever allow them to go sleeping when the measurements of urinary osmolality do not indicate that they are in a good rehydrated state. Because if you go sleeping in a dehydrated state, you will further dehydrate overnight and it will be extremely difficult to compensate for that in the next three, four hours that separate wake up in the morning and the start of the next stage. <coughs> what should you drink? These are data from Ron Mohan's group, published by Susan Shirips, and simply these data show that the, the test was that you do an exercise to dehydrate, and then you drink different volumes and different compositions of solutions. 50% means, for instance, that you have lost 3 kilos of body weight, and you only drink 50% of this volume. So you drink one and a half a liter. 200% means that you are three kilos dehydrated and you drink six liters. And you do it with two different compositions. One drink contains six mi 600 milligram sodium per liter and the other one contains 1,400 milligram sodium per liter. So a little bit more than double. And then when you compare both graphs, you can see that if within a time window of six hours, that's what we are talking about in Tour de France, the probably best or most easy way to get you hydrated within six hours is to use a solution containing a high concentration of sodium and still then you must be aware that you must drink about 150 percent of the body weight loss. This is an average of course and there is variability between people but if you lost after the stage or during the stage three kilos you are supposed to drink at least four and a half liters 
preferentially solutions containing a sufficient amount of sodium. It's important to know that if you just provide commercial waters to your riders, and if you are in Tour de France, we talk about mainly the French brands, Vitel, Contrexeville, Evian. These brands, they make publicity with the fact that they have extremely low sodium contents because sodium is bad for blood pressure. So, in fact, this is the same as saying that these drinks are far from be ideal to rehydrate. So if in a Tour de France you want to rehydrate your cyclist with these drinks, it's recommended to add some sodium to the drinks so you stimulate the process of rehydration by inhibiting the urinary excretion of what? You could also add just salty crackers, but again, just for the reason that nutrition in a Tour de France must be enjoyable. And it's nice on the bus to the hotel to eat some salty crack crackers after a stage in the heat because this delivers you sodium and at the same time you can drink water which is more enjoyable than just drinking salty water. So you have to think about creative solutions to have your nutrition being functional and enjoyable at the same time. Which actions do you have to take in the team? You have to design a nutritional strategy that is of course based on science and you have to translate it into a nutritional plan for each ride. And sometimes I am very often still, how to say, very surprised that even top international athletes, endurance athletes, they have no well-defined nutritional plan. I see many riders starting Ronde van Vlaanderen top riders and if you ask them what exactly are you going to drink and eat at what point of the race they are just delivered to improvisation which is obviously bad because it's so essential to performance to educate them to make a nutritional plan and it's up to the nutritionists to help them making this plan it's important to educate the people within the team and the cyclists why you do it because if they understand the core business of what you are doing, they will be more tempted to follow the instructions. And then it's very important that the people who really have to do the job in the team, the soigneurs and the doctors and the mechanics can also help, that they are <coughs> convinced that this is an important strategy and you have to support them in maintaining the nutritional system. This is almost the last slide and there I am going uh, making the step from a scientist to the field. When I am working in my lab at the university, I <coughs> mostly think in terms of <coughs> means. When we publish data in literature, we are mostly interested in means. We hate standard deviations because they prevent us from having statistical significance. <laughs> yeah. And we want to have significant data. So we think in means, what to use, that's protein, carbohydrate, fat, how much to use, that's a dosage, and when, that's the time. When I come out of the lab and I go in the Omega Pharma Quick Step Cycling Team, I don't think in means anymore. I take the science from the lab and I try to translate it into adequate standard deviation because each individual in the team is different. And then you don't talk about ingredients anymore, but you talk about food and drinks and they must be tasty and you must take into account the palatability. You must make sure that the riders can enjoy the food. Imagine that in the Tour de France, every evening in the restaurant, you have to eat out of a white plate, white pasta, on a white table, with white chairs, and all your teammates in white clothes on white walls. <laughs> you just get crazy. So the meals, the dinners, must be an enjoyable event and this relates to the previous talk that motivation and enjoying plays an important role in recovery and making nice enjoyable dinners helps athletes to recover and that's why in many teams, in more and more teams this is our team chef Tom Kohlberg, his, his task 
is to translate our nutritional recommendations into enjoyable meals for the riders. And I can tell you they don't drink champagne every race, but sometimes this happens. And I really hope that this will also happen on Saturday <laughs> with this man, though his jersey will be a little bit different, unfortunately, because he is not the English champion anymore. But still, I hope this will be what we will be seeing on Saturday. Not everybody here will be happy with this. But <laughs> <laughs> at least the English people are and I am. Thank you. fascinating talk and we have time for a few questions before we break for lunch. Thank you. The question is what do you think about to eat some sweets, some cakes uh, after the dinner when you find in the bed just before you want to sleep? Or it's better to not, not just do it? This still the, the most important strategy to recover is sleep well. Yeah? This is something we often forget that athletes they have to sleep and to rest. <coughs> if ingesting muffins or whatever nutri or whatever food or drink just before sleep prevents you from sleeping, you should just not do it. Because then you decrease the quality of sleep. But if this is not the case, I would always recommend still to use a small amount of carbohydrates and also protein to maintain the protein synthesis overnight on the condition that the sleep quality is okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question and then just a little bit of housekeeping. So, any further questions from there? Up at the back there. Can I just ask, uh, you're talking about 60 to, 90, 60 to 90 grams per hour, how much liquid is that, is that going to be? What sort, of, what sort of solution is that going to be using? We this, just, this is just a recommendation for the carbohydrate intake. If you would ingest all the carbohydrates in the form of energy bars, you have no fluid. If you ingest it all in the form of a typical isotonic or hypotonic drinking solution, this would deliver about 60 grams of carbohydrates per liter. And you have all the other things in between. If you use the gels, you have very little amount of liquid and you have very high amount of carbohydrates. So in these graphs, the focus is on the carbohydrates. This does not mean that you should forget about the rehydration. And apart from the slide indicating how much carbohydrates you must ingest, you can always add extra water. So you have to make a nutritional plan for the carbohydrates and then recommend to the athlete that he should drink extra water depending on his experience with dehydration. And then this is also very individual because some riders they sweat one liter per hour and others sweat 1.5 liter. So you can only make the general plan for the carbohydrates but not for the rehydration. Just, just before we sort of move on to the housekeeping, could I just also add wh when you're going over 60, so you're going more up to the 90 Power. Presumably we were looking at multi-transportable carbohydrates then. Yeah, it's an important point. It has been demonstrated that as long as you don't ingest more than 60 grams of carbohydrates per hour, you can use glucose, glucose polymers. If you want to absorb more, you must have a mixture of glucose and fructose, otherwise the small intestine cannot handle it. <coughs> so more than 60 means you need a mixture of glucose and fructose, typically in a ratio 2 to 1. Thank you very much again.